the name of the kids? Wait, stop everything. We're not ready. Yes, we are. <laughs> We're ready. But we have so many things to talk about we in do. this program. We do. I mean, it's just, it's, wow, it's mind-boggling. That's Fran Miller, Professor Fran Miller to you guys. She's a law professor at Boston University, and she's a visiting professor of law here at the William S. Richardson School of Law. She's been doing this nine years every spring. Why the spring? Never mind. <laughs> if you come from Boston, you don't ask why the spring. Okay, and when, uh, this is our show called Life in the Law, and our title of the show for this discussion is, uh, let's see, why should we care about the FDA? And I suppose inherent in that is, should we care more about the FDA or less? <laughs> or how should we think about it? How should we think about it? Um, and, and if you didn't get the idea, you know, uh, Professor Miller is into the FDA. <laughs> That's one of, the, one of the primary things that she teaches for many years. So the um, first thing is we've got to have a primer. And then we'll go to the news, Fran. Okay. So the primer is what exactly is the FDA? What does it do? What is its jurisdiction? I know it's not a simple question. And don't ask a question like that to a lawyer. Sorry. <laughs> but you know, it's going to be a six-hour show, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the important thing to know about the FDA is it regulates a quarter of the entire U.S. economy. And that encompasses 40% of all the products that are sold in this country, which is a huge, huge. regulatory burden. And it does that on a budget of $9 billion a year. Teeny, teeny. $9 billion a year, what's 40% what's of the U.S. economy? What's the U.S. economy? Something like... A lot more. <laughs> yeah, a whole lot of, what, 15 trillion, something like that. But they regulate it with a staff of about ten to 12,000 people. In other words, they're a tiny agency with a giant job. And there's a giant amount of information and technology involved in every product. There certainly is. Now... Uh, so what's, what's under their jurisdiction then? Well, let me... What's under their jurisdiction? I can do that for you in a minute, but first of all, to know what the, uh, uh, the FDA does, they regulate only with respect to products. So re they regulate things, not people. So they would regulate this. And you say, well, what is that? It's a bottle of water. And I said, well, yeah, it is at the moment. But I could take the label off of it and put another label. If I could. Easily. Take, take the label off. This was off. not rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> I can take the label off. And then how it gets regulated depends entirely on what I say about it, how I hold it out. So if I hold this out and say this stuff in this bottle, this water has very special medicinal properties and it can cure your fill in the blank, then I'm going to be regulated as a drug. On the other hand, if you said this drug has all kinds of sterilizing qualities and we can use it to sterilize dental instruments, it's going to be regulated as a device. Or if I hold it out and say, hey, this will really pump you up. You will, you know, you'll be, your six packs will be, you know, <laughs> showing, et cetera, or something like that, then I'm going to be diet regulated as a dietary supplement. If, on the other hand, I say, hey, this is stuff is a beverage, you know, it's a food, then it's going to be regulated as a food. And I'll just do one more. If I say, oh, this stuff is right out of a wonderful spa, thermal spring somewhere, and this stuff, if you just put it on your face, oh, <laughs> you're going to glow and be whatever. Um, you'll be beautiful. You got a cosmetic. <laughs> so lessons number one about food and drug law is how the purveyor holds it out that determines how it gets regulated. So nomenclature is everything. Well, not nomenclature, advertising. Advertising, advertising and labeling. Yeah, you know, okay. the claims you make again about your product determine how it's going to be regulated. Okay. So go back to the idea that the FDA regulates things, not people. And so it's out there and you know, if something is out there uh, that seems to be harming people, the FDA will go after the thing. They'll seize the shipment. They'll shut down the, the company, the production facilities, that kind of thing. But they aren't about stopping people as individuals from doing things. They're stopping the product. So they'd seize it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I suppose they'd send a notice out first and say, you can't sell that. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. I mean, this is the, yes, of course. And if you sell that, are you, are you oh, yeah. guilty of something? Oh, sure. 
you will be guilty of probably of a felony. And a even, felony? That's pretty serious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there are all kinds of the penalty phases. That's a whole other story. But let, let's leave that for another program another time. I, I, can, I can just see these two guys in a federal prison, you know. One asks the other one, what did you do? Well, interstate bank robbery, uh, kidnapping, and murder. And the other guy says, what did you do? He says, well, I shipped water across the state with the wrong label on it. Uh, no, it's, <laughs> you don't go to jail for the wrong label. <laughs> you go for, to jail for a more serious okay, thing. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, the FDA is, a, and it's basically a science-based agency. It, believe it or not, has an international reputation as the gold standard of any regulatory uh, you know, pharmaceutical regulatory agency anywhere. Mm -hmm. The world looks to the FDA. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it has, <laughs> believe it or not, remained relatively free from the kind of... Corruption. Uh, if you really want to put a tough name on it, yes. Certainly free from corruption. Uh, influence, maybe not always. Mm -hmm. But it's remained, it's held on to its reputation as a science-based agency very well for a very long time. It wasn't always thus, eh? I mean, we have an FDA because there was snake oil out there and oh, somebody yeah. had to fix it. Oh, absolutely. How, how did that happen? When did that happen? Uh, well, we've had some kind of regulation, starting with food regulation, from the get-go, you know, from the beginning of the country. The Romans had it, because uh, food was the thing that people were worried about the most, and adulterated food. But over time, our modern FDA really stems from uh, 1906, Upton Sinclair wrote uh, The Jungle. Remember that? Yes. And that sort of got people all upset about was what book. was going on. It was a on. book that, that spawned all this legal activity. And it was about what went on in slaughterhouses. Yes. Much of which... <laughs> Still goes on. Well, <laughs> there are books lately that will make you think the same. The conditions haven't changed that much. Yeah. But yes, they have changed a lot. But what, 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 what touches me is, is that we have a very fast-moving pharmaceutical research facility. I mean, research industry in this country. We have universities all over the place working on new drugs, um, you know, medical cures for every disease imaginable. I, I mean, like even that here, you use that word cures. How many treatment, cures? Treatment. Thank you. Sorry, I don't want to talk snake oil. Yes, <laughs> thank you. See, that's the problem. <laughs> it's easy to, you know, to, to spin it. Um, so, you know, we, we have so much technology going on. So the FDA has to be sophisticated about this and understand that technology, know when it's good, when it's not good, uh, that must be very difficult and demanding, beyond all the other, you know, food contamination issues. Yeah, the, the pharmaceutical business is, the, is a high-profile business that many people know about and care about, but it's also big business. And whenever it's big business, uh, you have many factors involved that are beyond the pure science. So what do you want to, do you want to talk about drugs? Well, I just want to, there are six things, and if you could just spin through them quickly and tell us the six things that fall within the jurisdiction of there, the FDA. Well, there's six major categories of regulation to do. And the first one, and I'm going to do these in sort of descending order of regulatory rigor. Mm -hmm. And so if you start with drugs, first of all, you have to define what is a drug. And I, told, I said it depends on how you hold it out. And the statutory definition is that a drug is an article, and that's about the equivalent of saying it's a thing. Mm -hmm. It's an article intended for use in diagnosis, cure, treatment, mitigation, or prevention of disease. So if you hold something out as intended to be used for diagnosis, cure, mitigate, treatment, mitigation, or prevention of disease, you are making a drug claim. And if you make a drug claim, you cannot go to market unless you get a license from the FDA. Well, what's the test? It has, to, it has to meet your assurances. It has to, if you promise it's going to do something, it has to do that. You have to prove that it is safe. And by that, I mean relatively safe. OK, that's, that's safe. Depending the water on, is safe. <laughs> well, depending on what you want to do with it. Rel relatively safe, and you have to use, show that it's efficacious. You can't just put it out there. If, if it doesn't do anything, if it's inert or something, you can't just put it out there and call it a drug. Whatever you say it's going to do, you have to do clinical trials to show that it does do what you're saying. So really, in, in large part, this is a matter of what you say it's going to do. If I say, for example, this water is efficacious in that it's going to hydrate your body. 
Is that it's, it? That's not very it, demanding. You know, no, I'm going to get you right there on that. That's a normal function of your body. It's not a disease. So it's so that's not so a claim I can that's, make. That's not a, you, well, you can make the claim, but you're going to make it as a food. Okay. Yeah, you're not going to make it, it, that's so, not a drug claim. Okay. You're not talking about disease. Okay, right. But so, if you say this drug is oh, going to disease, cure cancer. Right. You said disease, yeah. Okay. If you're going if you say this drug is going to cure cancer, then you have to run clinical trials that will show that it <laughs> doesn't that it does or does not cure do anything with it cure mitigate yada yada. Now we started, you know, with clinical trials, say in the 20s or the 30s, that was one level of science. But our clinical trials today are a different affair, aren't well, they? Well, actually in the 20s and 30s, we didn't have clinical trials. Oh, my goodness. They just put pr products out there. Yeah. Only in 1938 did they have to prove safety before going, before going to uh, market. And only in 1962 did they have to prove efficacy. So it's been a long it's been a long time coming to show safety and efficacy yes. of whatever you're putting out there, yes. saying that it does something for illness. But when we get into clinical trials, say compare 1962 against now, the state of science, the state of chemistry, the, the state of testing materials for efficacy, the state of logic, even if I can yeah, say, sure. the, the state of the whole. Mm, science of testing things for e efficacy is different now yes. and it must be much much more sophisticated it's very so much where more are these standards set does the fda set them in regulations is it in the statute somewhere is it in expert testimony where is it to show say relative safety and clinical efficacy you have to run a clinical trial that's the gold standard of proving it so there are three phases of clinical trials the first state the first phase is the safety phase and in that, they take healthy volunteers and they give them the product. And they give a small number of healthy uh, volunteers, let's say, a teaspoonful, and then a teaspoon and a half, and then two teaspoons, and so forth and so on, up to the point where the side effects start you know, undermining what's going. So they're looking for the most, you know, the maximum safe dose of whatever the product is that they can give. But That's the trial a, has to be approved in advance. Oh, yes. No, I can't just oh, no, no, decide go I'm going to give you another half teaspoon without getting somebody no, to no, say no. that's not no, no, dangerous no. You can't to do, do that. Yeah. This all, you go to the FDA ahead of time. You say, I am going to apply for a new drug application, an NDA. That's the license to market it in interstate commerce. And they say, okay, what are you going to do by way of clinical trials? And so you will have already done the bench science. You will have already sacrificed many animals to the cause, you know, <laughs> trying it out on animals. And, and you have when to you tell can, them that. Yes, because oh, yeah. they won't let you just do it de novo. They say, well, what makes you think it'll work? Yeah. And you say, well, I've done all this stuff. This is the science behind it. These are the animal studies. Now we're ready to try them on humans. So phase one trial, we get healthy volunteers usually, unless you've got a terribly toxic agent and it's unethical to try that on humans. Then you go to the people with the disease and try it on them to find the maximum safe dose. Because in that case, the, the risk is yes. it has some justification. Right. And just just as the risk has justification in that context, now I mean, and maybe this is a question. Um, now we have to justify taking a break. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. That's Fran Miller, law professor at Boston University, and visiting law professor here nine years every spring here at the William S. Richardson School of Law. We're talking about life in the law. Why should we care about the FDA? I'm caring more every minute. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon. And on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space. And uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. 
We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this, on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the Internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed health care consumers. Immature. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Fran Miller. She's a law professor at Boston University and visiting professor here at the William S. Richardson School of Law this spring. And we're here at Life in the Law. That's our program today, every uh, Wednesday. And uh, the question is why we should care about the FDA. Uh, so Fran was telling us about the, I guess, the, the, the six categories of products that are regulated by the FDA. And we we talked about drugs, and are we finished with that? No, you know, it's no, like going no. to a law class. This is great. I hope you're taking notes on this. Go ahead. Okay, we just finished talking about safety trials. We found the maximum safe dose. Now we have to do the efficacy trials. So we take a small number of people who've got the problem, give them the maximum safe dose, uh, have a placebo, and see what's happening here. Does it work? Doesn't it work? And if it does, if it's got reasonable demonstration of efficacy, then we go to a phase three trial, which combines both safety and efficacy on about two to 3,000, maybe 4,000 patients with the disease. And that's where you get your big, reliable, you know, cross-sectional data about whether it really is and safe and efficacious enough to go to market. So that's just, if you go through that big trial, that the some thousands, yeah. then, then you're going to get if you permission fly, to go to market. But there's a point I want to make sure you understand, and that point is that fewer than one in every five products that goes into clinical trials ever gets a license. Why? So, because they don't work or they're <laughs> unsafe, <laughs> one reason or the other. But fewer than one in every five products that gets wow. into trials. And if I want to back that up, if you talk about compounds, things you're using at the bench level, fewer than one in every 5,000 ever gets an NDA. So the odds are low that whatever product anybody's working on at any particular time is actually going to come to market. So if I'm, I'm an entrepreneur dealing with this, I mean, just, just the reality of it, how do I avoid being one of the casualties? <laughs> Very hard. <laughs> well, you, you pay a lot of attention to your bench science. You know, yeah. Most stuff gets thrown away at the bench science yeah. level. You pay a lot more attention to the animal trials, and you probably heard on the radio today they're talking about that paint that they that they are uh, paint glows it glows on brain tumors when yes, it attaches yeah. itself to cancer cells. Yes, yes, yes. Well, they are just moving from the animal stage of that paint to the human trials stage of that paint. Now, clearly, people have brain cancer. There's a, it's worth the risk, even though it's not a proven. Well, they, uh, they're just treatment. moving into clinical trials for that. Now, obviously, you can't use uh, healthy volunteers for the phase one trial of that one. You have to use people who have brain cancer. So, so even uh, the thing like painting, painting tumors in brain, uh, brain cancer has to be approved by the FDA. Absolutely. And uh, so, so and, and in the FDA, what, there are doctors and experts uh, who can help shape the parameters and of they these do. trials? And they do. And they help you be sure that it's statistically significant. It's set up so that you, whatever you get out of it will be statistically significant. Uh, they help you put it together. There's an ongoing dialogue between the manufacturers and the FDA. Even during the trials? Absolutely. So if, I, if somebody offers me 50 bucks to come down and take a pill... Um, no. <laughs> thank you. Those this is probably very good advice. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Those of us who study this, and I'm also on an institutional review board in Boston for Mass General, yeah. uh, Brigham and Women's and Dana-Farber Cancer Center. I know a lot about clinical trials. We have to sign off on them before anybody can go into them. Thank you very much, but I think I'll die with my hair. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, you heard it here on Think Tech. <laughs> I, no, I can't speak for everyone, but I know the odds, and I know, I know too much, perhaps yeah, for my yeah. own good. Well, it's not a trial because it's proven. <laughs> That's the whole <laughs> point. A clinical trial is to find out whether something is uh, going to be good enough or not. But let me just tell you two more things. Please. Uh, we're talking about prescription drugs or anything that's held out as a drug. Pre prescri prescription drugs are of two kinds. One is the small molecule drug, and that's, you know, like a chemistry set, you, you do it. Small molecule drugs are easy. 
and once they're out there, you know, they've got a recipe, and the recipe can be copied. So you have generics coming in when the patent expires on the Pioneer drug. Generics can come in, and they just use the same recipe, and they come up with the same product. And people go, oh, I would never take a generic. You know, oh, my doctor doesn't want me taking generics. You talk to them, they all take generics. They don't want to pay. Uh, and now that we have tiered co-payments on uh, drugs, Pioneer drugs cost an awful lot more than the generics, yeah. although their prices come down once the generic enters the market. The FDA doesn't care, though, about whether it's a, a patented, or rather it's a, you know, it, within a patent or it's generic, right? They're going to... Um, they evaluate it. Well, see, the thing about a generic is the generic gets to piggyback on the safety and e efficacy studies that have been done by the Pioneer drug. And, you know, the Pioneer drug doesn't like that, sure. but uh, so that's, that's the way the system works. They only works. get a patent for so long. No. And, and at the end of that, uh, the generic can come in. But let me add one thing. I said for prescription drugs, you have small molecule ones. Those are recipe guys. You also have biologics. And biologics, unlike small molecule drugs, are living organisms that uh, produce the... Like vaccines and that kind of... Yeah, thing. but vaccines are a different category. Sorry. They've been around for a long time. Yeah. I'm talking about the things that Biogen, IDEC makes, that Genzyme makes. You know, these very Advanced. tricky... Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they also target orphan diseases for whom, for which there are very few therapies, et cetera. A lot of, be, a lot of money to be made in biologics. Well, yeah. we are just now seeing the first generic biologics. Because the patents have run out. The patents have run out, but with, with uh, biologics, they, the, the way they describe them, the process is the product. It's not so much the ingredients, the way it is with small molecule drugs. Yeah. So there's been a lot of controversy over whether there is any such thing as a generic biologic. They call them biosimilars, but they are not necessarily bioidenticals. So there's a lot of movement and action in that area of uh, bringing generic biologics to the market. The first one was just uh, approved within the last yeah, X number of months. stuff is right now. Oh, yeah. So it, it strikes me that the, the regulations must be changing all the time, uh, that you have it's to... It's not so much the regulations, it's, it's the guidances, it's the things that are the level below regulations. How do I know what they are? Are they written down? Where? Oh, sure. Where uh, do FDA's I look? website is terrific. You go on FDA.gov, it is comprehensive, it's got a good search engine, and if whatever field you're in, you're going to know where your stuff is. And the, and the person who interfaces with the FDA on this, it's not a lawyer, is it? Or maybe it is. Well, a lawyer better be shepherding the whole thing. Yeah. But it, it, it'd be a scientist, uh, a manufacturing a whole, person? A or? whole bunch of people. Whoever is needed to address the issue the FDA is in, interested in at the time. So and the, the FDA was saying, here's the question. Now you find somebody in the company right. can answer that. Who can come talk, tell me about it. So wait a minute. We just did prescription. Let me just finish off the drug thing. The next generics we talked about. So prescription drugs, uh, then we have generics. They are the same as the prescription drug if it's a small molecule, similar enough if mm -hmm. it's a biologic. Mm -hmm. And then we have OTCs, over-the-counters. So when you go into lungs and go up and down the aisles and look at all the different uh, cold remedies, That's all aspirin, by the FDA. Uh, what they are, they have monographs for over-the-counters. Over-the-counters are ones for which they figure we don't need an intermediary physician to make the prescribe, pres to yeah. prescribe it. You can tell yourself when you got a headache or yeah. you know, what's muscle. A monograph, though? Well, a monograph <laughs> is a piece of paper with rules on it. Okay. And, you know, monograph is like a small pamphlet. Yeah. And the FDA has monographs for various kinds of over-the-counter. Which tell you what it does. No, tell you what's in it. Okay. And, for example, a sunscreen is an over-the-counter drug, actually, because it makes cure, mitigate claims. So it is, in fact, a drug. An aspirin's a drug. A uh, cold remedy is a drug. All those things that they make, they make claims mm -hmm. about curing, diagnosing, yada, yada. Uh, um, medical illness. So they make those claims, but they are low-risk items. So the FDA has come out with a whole series of monographs on various categories of products. So if it's a sunscreen, you look at the monograph, and then you come up with one. So if you wanted to make some money, if you asked about entrepreneurs, you want to make some money, 
you sit there, you look at all the FDA monographs, and you say, well, all I have to do is use this recipe, and assuming there's no patent that's going to stop it. And I get approval. And that can go to market. You know, FDA will practically wave it through as long as you meet that. And so you'll say, well, if we perfume it this way and put it in a nice emolument cream this way, we can, uh, and, and we advertise it that way, we can get in there and, you Does know. Does this happen? <laughs> all the Lots. time. All those shelves are filled with this sort of thing. If you pick up all the ibuprofen-like things and look at the back, you'll see they are identical. You know, bare, I can't remember who they all are, uh, Advil, you know. I, I'm probably mixing up products there. Is Advil the same? Does Bayer do aspirin, it? Yeah. yeah. All right. You look at the back, and they're all the same. So I go with the one with the lowest advertising budget because it's going to be the cheapest. I go with the house brand. I don't even think about going with something that I see on TV. Yeah. Once you see it on TV, my God, the costs have just gone like that. Yeah, yeah. It's great stuff. You can so actually, if you know about this, you can shop better. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, now, so it's easy to do with the monographs. Um, Easy to get into the business and, with the monographs. And you say, and you say it's the FDA writing the monographs, not the... Yes. On the FDA is writing the monographs on products that it's, have decided, that it's decided don't need a physician intermediary to write the prescription. So those kinds of products are safe enough for consumers to make their own decisions about them. And as long as whatever manufacturer is out there wants to put it in and will follow the monograph. Now what about the actual product, though? I mean, suppose I had this product made in a small town in Bolivia, uh, which was not too concerned about the purity oh, of no, the no. ingredients. You, no, you've got to meet. They've got good laboratory practices, you know, good storage practices. There's all kinds, if you want to call so them rats. So somebody's going to come from the FDA and look. Uh, probably they're not going to go to wherever you were, Bolivia. Buy a sample, then. They're probably not going to Bolivia, but if anybody gets hurt here, you know, if anybody has some contaminants here and gets sick, they're going to shut them down fast enough. Or they're going to shut down the imports. So it's on a reactive basis. It's not on a preliminary approval They do basis. do spot checking of a lot of things, but obviously I just... You can't do it all. I started out telling you how few employees they have. <laughs> Are they going to mess around with stuff that's not really going to do that much harm? Yeah. No, yeah. they're going to concentrate their resources on places where people get hurt. It, and it, it does happen, though, right? I mean, there could be some of these monographs type drugs that hurt people. And Not if you follow the monograph, but if right. they're but if they are manufactured, it was if made in the wrong place. If they're right. manufactured in filthy uh, working conditions, sure. Yeah. And all that stuff about compounding pharmacies. Remember back a few years ago, that yeah. place in Massachusetts. Yes. I can't remember how many people died because they had some kind of spinal injection. Uh, being manufactured in a filthy, filthy laboratory that was allegedly being expected by the Massachusetts, uh, the Department of Health in Massachusetts, but compounding ph pharmacies were at that time in this regulatory limbo between federal and state regulation that allowed them to escape the kind of oversight that uh, other drugs didn't have. So uh, that was. That was the kind it's of really an important function of the FDA, right? To, and they to, and they protect us from that. Yes, yeah. and it wasn't it. You know, it was partially their fault, but it was also the fault of Massachusetts regulators and the fault that neither one of them was doing the thorough job that ought to have been done. You're going to hate when I tell you we're going to take another break now. I'm going to love it. <laughs> I need a glass of water. <laughs> have that. <laughs> That's a Fred Miller, law professor at Boston University, visiting professor for nine years here at the William S. Uh, uh, William, uh, Richardson. Richardson School of Law. Get that one right. <laughs> Life in the law here on Wednesday afternoon. Why should we care about the FDA? We'll be right back, and you'll see you haven't even started caring yet. You're going to care much more. We'll be right back. Inspired by an ancient culture, classical Chinese dance, Vigorous physicality, timeless stories, 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance, Shen Yun presents authentic Chinese culture. Coming to Blaisdell Concert Hall, May 8th and 9th, tickets at ShenYun.com or call 808-792-3919. 
Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on the Think Tech Digital Series. The show is every Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and I want you to watch this show because I think that when we talk with artists on the show about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, why they do it, I believe that it resonates within each of us and we find something inside of ourselves that brings us closer to all of humanity. That's what arts are there to do and that's what I'm here to do on this show. That's Center Stage. It's on every Wednesday from 2 to 3 o'clock. I hope to see you there. We are so enjoying our discussion with Fran Miller, law professor at Boston University and at William S. Richardson School of Law this spring. In life in the law here on Wednesday, why should we care about the FDA? We should care about the FDA. And we have stories to prove that. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to cover the categories that they cover. And I think we're on to devices. Okay, medical devices are the hot new topic. And devices are uh, front and center on lots of issues at the moment. Now, the definition of a de medical device is the same as a drug, an article intended for use in diagnosis, cure, treatment, mitigation, or prevention of disease, or intended to affect the structure or function of the human body, but not by chemical action in the body. A prosthesis. Yes. Okay. Or a implanted hip. Yes. Uh, that kind of thing, or a cardiac stent. Yes. They're all devices. Uh, there are three classes of devices. Uh, the class one device is things like Band-Aids. You know, it's you know, mitigate bleeding or the whatever. The FDA approves Band-Aids. No, I didn't say they approve them. I said they're a class one. Okay, okay. Class one devices are, you know, low tech, low down the feeding chain there. And all you have to do is give the FDA notice that you're putting it on the market. So they know who you are, where you are, and if somebody starts getting you know, hurt by dirty bandages, they'll something. come after you. <laughs> okay. All right, class two devices are in the middle, and then there are surgical drapes, electric wheelchairs, things of that order. Mm -hmm. And when you have a class two device, you come to market by way of what's called a 510K petition. Obviously, government speak for the thing you have to fill out, so which you basically, form. yeah, you fill out the application form, give it to the F FDA, and they decide whether you have to give them any more than that. But okay. they look at it. And the important thing for you to know and never forget is that 98% of all medical devices come to market through the 510K process, i.e., the FDA is not really doing anything about it. They're, they're waving them through. I'll come back to that in just a second. And a class three device is one that you treat like drugs. So that's an implantable or a life-sustaining device, a cardiac stand, a defibrillator, something like that. And in that case, you have to go through a full pre-market safety and efficacy review the way you do with drugs, mm -hmm. but not with so many people. <laughs> smaller trial. Very much smaller, because you can't have a placebo arm of a trial of a surgical implant. Right, you don't learn anything without a placebo, <laughs> so. Well, you know, what are you going to do? Well, you're not going to operate on somebody if you're not going to, if they don't have a problem and you're not going to do something for them. You know, you, sham operate surgery. Operate and put a piece of sugar in there. <laughs> well, Ooh. yes, well, you see why we don't do that. So, anyway, so class three, with, with 510K petitions, as long as you have what's called a predicate device out there, and you're just making mo tiny modifications to that device that's out there, you can go to market with it. And actually the same with some class three devices. So I, I want to just use a cardiac stent as an example. I don't know if you've ever seen one, but they, are, they look, the size is like a little spring inside a ballpoint pen, mm -hmm. except they're teeny, teeny, teeny. They're like about a tenth the size of a Spring in a Spring ballpoint. ballpoint pen. Yeah. And the first time on our institutional review board at Mass General, we were approving these. They came in, and, and instead of being like a spring, they had little squares, little open squares. And you know, that you put them on a catheter into a vessel, and then it, you know, expands it and yeah. expands to prop the vessel open. Yeah. So the first time we did it, they had little squares, and we, you know, we went through all the, do we subject people to this? Well, yeah, maybe, okay. And then we finally did, okay, they got approved. And then the next guy came along and said, well, I think if we make little tiny circles, that would be better. So here we had out there 
we'd already approved this guy with the squares. So this guy with the circles comes in and he said, we did. And we looked and we said, oh, we got a predicate device and this is only a tiny change on it. So, okay, we'll approve it. And we go like that. And then a new guy comes along and says, well, I think I'm going to make one with little tiny triangles. We say, okay, well, it looks like the squares and the circles. So, and pretty soon you're out here with the predicate devices and your original one was way back with a totally different design. Is that good? <laughs> there are a lot of people, well, manufacturers would say yes. Uh, when you get too far out there, you, you start it's not to think maybe we, anymore. Yeah, we better go back to It's like and prior take art in the patent law. Isn't it? it is. Yeah, yeah. So, device regulation is very interesting. And one of the things I mentioned to you, uh, I don't know if you know about 23andMe, but it's. If you go look it up in Google, 23andMe. Oh, this was the DNA testing. Yeah, you do the DNA testing. Well, they yeah. went out there and they said, you know, send us, you know, spit in a little jar, send it to us, Swab. and we'll yeah. and we'll map your genome and send back a report telling you whether you carry the BRCA gene, the you know, the gene for Huntington's chorea, you know, all kinds of things like that. Yeah. And the FDA said, whoa, wait a minute, this is a medical device. And we haven't you know, done it because... They hadn't even tried. They didn't see it as subject to the FDA. Well, they, they had been warned. Oh, oh. So, so There's they, a whole backstory so to that. avoided the issue. If then. you want to read an interesting story, read the backstory to 23 okay. and me. But anyway, okay. we won't go there. <laughs> um, they'd been warned. But they went out and the FDA said, look, and I'm using my Exhibit A. I wish I had a picture. Angelina Jolie. What did she do when she found out she, had, she carried the BRCA? Uh, gene that had killed her mother. She's had a double mastectomy, oh, that's right. yeah. and just last month, the, just yeah, two or yeah, three weeks yeah. ago, she had the op-ed in the New York Times. She'd and if that was wrong information, if yes. that device wasn't doing what it was supposed to do, she wasted you know, that, that operation. <laughs> a beautiful a, body. A beautiful body. Oh, Angelina. <laughs> no, and she just had her ovaries removed as well because she said her mother died of ovarian cancer. So. If you, it's one thing to go to your, you know, your gynecologist or your oncologist and get this information and have a long discussion about whether it's right for you to do that. It's quite another to have to spin rely on a, somebody's a, test in, in Bolivia. A, well, <laughs> it's always by mail, isn't it? Yes. And sometimes the guy who actually makes the test is is a continent away. Well, uh, twenty three and Me is California, yeah. Silicon Valley, uh, but. The FDA stopped them, and you know they said, "Well, we're not a medical device. This doesn't go into a body. It doesn't even touch the person." But it's how it was held out. It's held out to diagnose. And they said, "Well, we're not diagnosing. We're just saying she carries the gene." Well, that's moving into the area that people are going to start sure, acting on the basis of. Act in reliance on it. Now, uh, this this opens the whole issue about um, testing. All kinds of medical laboratory testing must therefore also be subject to FDA. If I give a blood sample and it goes down to uh, one of the local laboratory, diagnostic laboratory, for example, everything they do, everything they use will be subject to FDA. Well, right? they, yes, and FDA, and there are there is other legislation that governs them as well. Okay. Clinical laboratories, CLIA, whatever the I stands for, ACT. There's a whole set yeah. of regulation there. And, and it's not that the actual act of taking blood, for example, uh, is dangerous, although it has its dangers. It's the the act of giving you information, information w on which you rely. In I think that's a very the... good thing that we should be protected from bad information. I think it's an excellent Especially thing. Especially Angelina. <laughs> yes. All right. Now I want to go to dietary supplements, which takes okay. us partly to the news business. What well, okay. we got for time? Six minutes. Six minutes. Okay. Dietary supplements. Uh, I, I wish I had my slides with me so I could show you. Uh, what Give we're us a word picture. Well, the word picture is everything that's in GNC. Okay. You go down okay. the aisles of GNC <laughs> or, you know, the far aisle over at uh, Whole Foods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that dietary supplements. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. what is it? It's any quote, the statute says, any dietary substance intended to supplement the diet but not serves the whole meal. So Metrical, stuff like that doesn't count. If it's the whole meal in a bottle, no. But anything intended to supplement the best the body. So, you know, those things at the checkout line that say uh, five hour energy shot. Yeah. That's if it a supplement. We have dietary supplement. You know, you're not getting enough energy from your food. Yeah. 
oh, well, I'll try this. And you look at that and you say, any fool who would pay $2.97 or whatever it costs in Hawaii it's not cheap. for that when they could go get a cup of coffee. But then I say, well, it's Starbucks coffee. Maybe it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> but all of this is caffeine. So what's the, what's the justification for the distinction between that and the, and the full meal thing? Well, dietary supplement, you know, dietary what, what, by and large, they come in a What's in the a risk jar that or, that has that the full meal doesn't have? Oh, well, the full meal we're going to regulate is food. Okay. And this is, uh, dietary supplements are a creature. It's called Deshae, the Dietary Supplement word? Education. Oh, okay. <laughs> D-S-H-E-A. Okay. Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1992 which is the brainchild of Orrin Hatch, who is known as the godfather, and I do mean the godfather, <laughs> of the dietary supplement industry. He's been standing there protecting them for uh, eons because Utah is the home of uh, a great many supplements. dietary supplement <laughs> manufacturers. It's just as Colorado is the home of the <laughs> large pot. <laughs> it certainly is. Well, uh, so Deshay basically called off the dogs with the FDA. The FDA was about to move in on some popular dietary supplements, those multivitamin C things that were having 10,000 units of vitamin C in one uh, pill yeah, or one. Which is not necessarily good for you. Uh, it's probably kind of bad for you, but <laughs> okay. Linus Pauling was, you know, remember, hawking yeah. it at the, I don't mean he's hawking, selling it personally, but yeah, I mean he yeah. was espousing. Mega doses of vitamin C. Yeah. And the FDA was knowing the safety profile of taking megadoses was starting to move on it. And Orrin Hatch said, oh no, and it was moving on it as a drug, saying this is, you're making drug claims, and so therefore, and they do make drug, well, they make claims that skirt just this side of a club, drug claim now, but what they, they were gonna move on them. And so the whole industry went nuts. And you'd go into places like GNC, they'd have a table like this with draped in black and then they have everything on it that were their most popular sellers and it said <laughs> said the fda is going to take this away from you unless you write your congressman and i once That's talked it's not really true it wouldn't take it away it was just subjected to, to yeah, yeah but they did that well and, and i once talked with the librarian of congressman congress who told me that congress people got more mail on that issue <laughs> of regular the fda regulating dietary supplements than in any other issue in the entire 20th century, except for the Vietnam War. They have very, very, very powerful backlash against it. I guess so. And as a result of it, Deshay was passed, which basically disabled the FDA from regulating dietary supplements before they go to market. They can only react after the market, which is why a headline like this. Yeah, let's talk about this. This article is like today. It's April 7th in the Times, and, and it, was also, it was in the Star Advertiser It was today. in the Star, and yeah. the, the title says, Study Warns of Diet Supplement Dangers Kept Quiet by the FDA. And a headline like that makes me just crazy, because the FDA has been disabled, emasculated, if you will, from regulating dietary supplements before the fact. When you take any dietary supplement that's out there now, you're taking, excuse my language, a pig and a poke. Uh, because it has not been evaluated for safety or efficacy, or if it has, it's probably marketing itself as an OTC drug. Uh, because the dietary supplements do not have to show, they don't have to show they work, and they don't have to show they're reasonably safe. The only thing they can do is go after them after the fact. What and about impurities? If they're, if they're pulled out of the FDA, does the FDA look at their impurities? FDA has two things, two powers. One, they can go after you for adulteration. That means it's, you know, got bad products in it or it's filthy or, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. Or misbranding. You're saying things you can't say about it. Mm -hmm. And misbranding is one of the issues with respect so, to... That's no longer the case because of this amendment, by. Well, this amendment says you can make certain claims, but only certain claims. You can't make what is known as drug claims. So you can, you can make health claims, but you can't make drug claims. So dietary supplement, yeah, <laughs> indeed. So dietary supplement makers uh, have to be very, very careful about what they say. But if you look at a lot of dietary supplements down at the bottom, right here in a teeny, teeny thing, and I think it has to be 
something, point something, at least point something font. Well, you take a look, go to GNC, pull something up, take a look at that bottom, and it said, this statement has, no, this product has not been evaluated by the FDA. I mean, there's a disclaimer that has to be on the bottle. The problem is there's no countervailing group that would come around and say, no, the FDA should have jurisdiction over that. Uh, it's, it's, not only, now. it's only the crowd in, in GNC and, uh, and Hatches and Hatches Minions. That's what it is. So we should care. I guess the bottom line of this show is we should care about the FDA. We they should. They protect us. Right. And, and we uh, didn't even touch food. Do we have one minute? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, you will have to do it again. I, I, I would like to do it again. Maybe I'll, you know, catch you out again. Fran, Fran Miller, a law professor, Boston University, visiting here at uh, William S. Richardson School of Law for nine years. Life in the law here on Wednesday. Why we should care about the FDA, and we're not, we're not finished caring yet. <laughs> Thank you, Fran. Okay. It was a pleasure. <laughs>